Hello, I'm Michael Brown, President of the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe, New Mexico, speaking to you from my office at SAR. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this third event in our Senses of Place Summer Series. Across four events, the series explores the cultural significance of place and shares new insights on the relationship between cultures and the structures created in their unique environments and according to their specific historical circumstances. The series concludes on July 8th with a program entitled Showing Our Strength, Resilience and Compassion in the Indigenous Southwest, a panel discussion presented in partnership with Thornburg Investments and with additional support from the Ethel Jane Westfeld Bunting Foundation, Newman's Own Foundation, and Patricia G. Foshi. The July 8 program will present perspectives from representatives of Native-led organizations, highlighting the resilience and perseverance over the past year within the landscape of the Indigenous American Southwest. Links to that event are available in our chat, uh, the chat window in Zoom. Finally, we're hosting a member conversation after today's speakers at 4 p.m. Mountain Time. There's still room to take additional members on board. If you're interested, please email Amy Schiffer, our membership coordinator, whose email address will be in the chat box. And she will share a link with you. The conservation, sorry, the conversation is open to current members. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to thank our SAR members for supporting our programs. If you're not yet a member, we encourage you to join. You can find information in the chat now. And we'd particularly like to thank the Ethel Jane Westfeld Bunting Foundation for supporting the Census of Place series. Today's program also serves as this year's annual Cordell Lecture. Dr. Linda S. Cordell came to SAR in 2006 as a distinguished senior scholar. She's by that time already achieved a renowned, was already recognized as a renowned archeologist and the author of profoundly important works on archeology span and anthropological archeology span in the Southwest. In 2015, SAR established a fund to provide archeologists and admirers of Linda Cordell the opportunity to make a meaningful gift in her memory. The contributions to the Linda S. Cordell Fund help us to share an annual archeology span lecture like the one today with our member community. The continuation of the annual lecture is made possible by generous support from donors to this fund. If you'd like more information about contributing to the fund in memory of Linda Cordell, please contact Lindsay Archuleta. Her contact information is now in the chat window. Now on to today's program. I'll introduce Professor Catherine Cameron, who will introduce her co-presenters. Kathy Cameron is an archeologist working in the American Southwest with a particular focus on the Chaco phenomenon. She's conducted excavations at the Bluff Great House site in Bluff, Utah, as part of the University of Colorado Field School. She's written uh, and been published. She has written and been published extensively, and her books include Chaco and After in the Northern San Juan Excavations at the Bluff Great House, published in 2009 by the University of Arizona Press. In 2010, she was SAR's Weatherhead Fellow, during which time she worked on a book about captives in prehistory. I must say she's also one of our most fondly, fondly remembered resident scholars. She's currently a professor of anthropology at the University of Colorado Boulder. Kathy and colleagues, welcome to this webinar. I'm doing a handoff to Kathy now. All right, well, thank you, Michael. Um, and, and thanks to the audience for tuning in. Uh, we're all very excited. All the panelists are very excited about being part of this um, discussion. Um, as, as Michael said, uh, this is the Linda Cordell lecture, and I just wanted to say a word or two about Linda. Um, she was one of the premier Southwestern archaeologists. She literally wrote the textbook on Southwestern archaeology, and she was a friend to, to all of us on this panel uh, and was a mentor to several of us. Um, she had a keen mind and was always open to new ideas. She was also generous and supportive to younger scholars, um, and uh, we all benefited from that. So we hope she'd be intrigued. Um, she'd, she'd have been intrigued by some of the ideas that we present today. So the panel uh, today will explore how Chaco Canyon came to be a place of profound meaning for ancestral Pueblo people, and how Chaco Great House architecture materialized the canyon as a central place. 
uh, this was a place on the landscape that was made. It was crafted uh, by ancient people. The act of creation was then remembered and memorialized over hundreds of years. Now at the end, uh, we'll explore how eventually Chaco's significance faded and the religious and political ideas that animated Chaco reemerged many miles to the north. So before the, we begin our discussion, uh, let me briefly introduce the other panelists. I'll present them in the order in which they'll speak. Ruth Van Dyke is a professor of anthropology at, um, at Binghamton University in New York. Um, she's published widely on landscape and memory, especially of Chaco Canyon. Her book, The Chaco Experience, Landscape and Ideology at the Center Place is a foundational text for these ideas. And I might also point out it as an SAR volume as well. Phil Tuluetstua is an engineer and geodetic scientist, and he was an officer for the, in the uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. He's an indigenous scholar and a member of the Hopi tribe. His work has focused on Chaco Canyon, where he merges Western science with native perspectives in his interpretation of the canyon. Steve Lexen is a professor emeritus at the University of Colorado Boulder. He studied Chaco Canyon and its architecture for more than 40 years. And he brings history into the study of Chaco and ideas, and he places Chaco in a continental context. Um, so now let me hand the, the mic, as it were, over to Ruth, and she'll begin our discussion. Hello, everyone. I hope you can all see and hear me well without too much lag. I'm Ruth Van Dyke, and I'm coming to you live from Chaco Canyon. I was honored to be asked to be part of this panel today by Kathy, who's a longtime friend, um, as was Linda Cordell. So it's a tremendous uh, privilege to be among this group of very esteemed Chaco scholars this afternoon. And uh, Kathy asked me to kick things off by talking a little bit about, about entering Chaco and about Chaco's beginnings. So since I'm here in Chaco Canyon doing field work, and since we are blessed with Wi-Fi uh, in a, a small area that's known as the VIP campground where my crew and I are stationed, I'm going to give you a little bit of a walkabout here. And we're going to walk out from the kitchen trailer and I'm going to attempt to walk out to the road and show you all the iconic Pajada Butte, which I'm sure if you've been to Chaco, you're very familiar with. Here we go. You're seeing all of the campground business behind me. And then what I'm going to do here is turn around. Okay, there we go. So what you should all be looking at now is some of the ranger housing and then you can see Fajada Butte poking up there. You can also see we've been getting quite a lot of rain in Chaco, which has been wonderful, but also um, made our field work a little bit more problematic. But so, so Fajada Butte is this iconic landform that was created by erosion and downcutting you know, millions of years ago and is in the middle of this area called Fajada Gap. And then of course we have Looking over there, I don't know if you can really see, there's Chakra Mesa to one side, there's South Mesa to the other side. And of course, the big iconic great houses of Chaco Canyon are further down the, the area created by the Chaco Wash, or as it's been for the last few days, the Chaco River, which cuts through this area. Why did people come to this place? That's often a question that I'm asked, and I think that all of us are asked by, by folks interested in Chaco. And a wise man who was actually on this panel, whose name is Philip Tuoletsua, once told me that a big reason is this, this place right here behind me, Fajada Butte. The, the landscape here is really dramatic, right? And not only that, you can see places like Fajada Butte for a very, very long way away. 
so when when people drive like like you do today into Chaco, you come on the the road um, from you turn off of 550 and you you go down the paved and then graveled and then badly washboarded road bouncing along in your in your vehicle. You 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 need to pay attention from a long ways away because you might realize that you can actually see Fajada for many 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 miles. And in fact, you can see Fajada from just about every direction for many 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 miles. So I think that people all the way back in basket maker times, but certainly during, during classic Chaco times, they were very interested in the landscape and the sense of place itself, right? And they, uh, they, they viewed places like this as potentially really powerful or really sacred. Um, we can't know exactly what they were thinking, although we can certainly talk to descendant communities and learn that way about what their ancestors may have been thinking. Um, but you probably are all aware that there are astronomical markers on top of Fajada, and it's simply iconic. So I think that element of the dramatic landscape was part of what drew people here. So now I'm going to walk back to where my Wi-Fi is a little better, but you have a little bit less exciting view of the maintenance yard behind me, and go back to my little trailer area and talk a little bit more about... So we enter Chaco today in our vehicles, but people, of course, in the past entered Chaco on foot. And they likely entered Chaco on some of the, the major road segments that Chacoans constructed or on trails that extend into the canyon from various directions. And the people of Chaco Canyon, the people living here, who I think were very important and powerful, you'll hear more about that, I'm sure, in a few, they were, they were manipulating the buildings, the great houses, and where things were sited on the landscape, I think, to help create not only kind of a dramatic effect, but to help emphasize and illustrate ideas that were really important in the ancient Pueblo world. And these are ideas like cardinal directions or like up and down, because I think that Chaco was constructed to be a center place, the center that essentially balanced cardinal or perhaps also intercardinal directions and balanced the, the vertical dimension, the sky above and the earth beneath. So for all of those reasons, the landscape of Chaco itself attracted people. And then once people were here, starting back in the basket maker period, at least, basket maker three, about 450 to about 700 um, common era, once people were here, there were ancestors here and ancestors and memories began to attract people. So that by the time of High Chaco, which is several hundred years later, more like maybe 1040 uh, common era, you had a multiple several century history of a lot of important events happening here, a lot of ceremonies that had happened here, the landforms were here, and people continued to come. And I think this became somewhat of a pilgrimage center for quite a while as people continued to walk into Chaco and participate in ceremonies and, 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 and feel themselves as part of this place in the center, in the center of the Pueblo world at that time. So I think it's about time for me to hand this off to the next speaker, who is my good friend, uh, Philip Tuilitztiwa. So Philip, you have the mic. Thank, <clears throat> Thank you, Ruth. Um, that was a lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not in my normal office, so it's a little awkward, but uh, I'll see what I can do here. Um, I wanna talk about the sense of place. Thank you for asking me to be on this path up panel. When Kathy asked me to participate, she suggested I discuss Chaco astronomy, but after writing the background for the astronomy, the talk was way too long. So the astronomy will have to wait. If you ask a Hopi a question, they might start with the emergence from the third to the fourth world. So in Hopi fashion, I'm gonna start with a story to introduce my take on Chaco and a sense of place. For the Hopi tribe, I held the Office of Cultural Preservation, retrace and map the ancient salt trail that runs from arriving to the confluence of the Colorado and Little Colorado rivers. One day, seven of us walked along the bottom of a small canyon where the Hopi salt trail forks west towards the Little Colorado River 
near the Hopi Shrine Salt Woman. The sun was high and the walls of the canyon offered little shade. The heat of the day fell on us like the breath of an oven. Our journey along the canyon bottom was over cobblestones, past small boulders, across sand and around scrub brush. We followed the path of our Hopi ancestors who had made this same journey. On my part, it was an act of memory, appreciation, curiosity, and homage. We emerged into an open area closed at one end by a narrow passage in the rocks. Before us stood a pool of water. The water had a green cast and was hot to the touch. Swimming in it were hundreds of black tadpoles. In wonder, I stared at the water and this new life in one of the most isolated and harsh areas of Northern Arizona. Within the landscape of green water, heated sky, burning sand, and black tadpoles resided the core spirit of our Hopi existence. Around the edge of the pond grew a verdant patch of Hopi tobacco. In the water wiggled primal life. Water is our life force. The water's surface reflected the canyon walls, the sky, clouds, and the sun. Below the water's surface was the dark path to the lower world. I wondered how many Hopis walked here, drank their full perhaps, prayed and gave thanks to what the creator privileged them to see. I imagined an unbroken line of ancestors stretching from Arrivi to this place. I felt they welcomed us. Images and thoughts flashed through my mind. The pool contained in its apparent simplicity an intricate message. Looking into it through the water and past the tadpoles, I stared into the underworld, a place and a path I shall travel when I die. On the water's surface, I saw reflection of the sky and clouds, the upper world. I saw my own image surrounded by the canyon walls. I stood at a center place where universes converge, a merging of images real and not real, all meeting at this one small pool of water. At that moment, life was full, all felt connected. What I experienced in my canyon walk is a worldview passed down through generations of Hopis from our Chacoian ancestor. This worldview encompassed the upper world or cosmos, the middle place or material world, and the underworld, hidden but present. This physical, metaphoric, and iconic expression of the tripart world lives in the Chaco landscape. Chaco's architecture, iconography, and astronomy expresses it. Worlds merge at Chaco as they did for me at that pool. Many of us feel a strong connection to Chaco, both emotionally and physically. I recently found out from a DNA study I participated in with Steve LeBanc from the Piedmont Museum that my closest ancestral relatives were from room 33 at Bonita. And my other deep connection is when camping in Chaco in 1984, I met my wife, Judy. Chaco is a place of mystery. We know little about the ancestors' conscious and unconscious thoughts and feelings. We do not know their language, religion, rituals, ceremonies, and social structure. Scholars offer original theories and arguments exploring these unknowns, but definitive answers are elusive. I never tire of looking at the Chaco buildings, and Potter. When I do, I try to imagine what the ancestors might have thought as they awoke each morning or fell asleep each night. I imagine the to greet the sun, saying their prayers, 
and making their offerings. Their existence depended on the light from the sun and moisture from the clouds. As they worked, they watched the sun follow its paths across the sky. They must have seen it as a powerful force that personified the upper world. These upper world phenomena, sun, moon, stars, clouds, rain, snow, directed their rituals, ceremonies, planting, gathering, and hunting. The earth, the center world, the middle place, the material world, sustained them with plants, animals, fire, materials, springs, and river. To them, the rocks, mountains, plants, and streams were living beings because within their earthly form dwelled spirit and soul. These living beings possess great powers and deserve respect and veneration as the people's existence depended on them. Our ancestors saw their existence as a journey. When they died and passed from the middle world, they continued to the underworld where their ancestors dwelt. The lower world is mysterious, but not unknown. Each night they entered the dream world, a fluid, obscure, esoteric world of symbols, paradoxes, and transformation. The night world is the opposite of the material world. Nonetheless, it would creep into the ancestors' waking world. Why did the bird speak to me in a dream last night? Will a bird speak to me today? The unconscious world resonated with them during their waking hours. They depended on it for insight, meaning, and understanding. It was as real to them as the middle world. Today at Hopi, conscious and unconscious worlds are separated by a very thin membrane. I suspect this was true for the ancestors. I feel this at Chaco. I am confident the ancestors believed, believed in the three tiered worlds. Specifically, we see it in their kivas, buildings, shrines, and the Bonita glyph on Fajardo. The kiva, those round underground structures, have all the components of the three worlds a domed roof and a ladder reaching from the floor to the sky that is a portal from the middle world to the upper world. On the kiva floor, one can stand, sit, work, or sleep. It is a space to perform rituals and ceremonies, a place like the physical world where the sacred and profane merge. Then there's the underworld beneath the floor, sometimes symbolized by the Sipa Puni, a passageway between the underworld and this world. Sometimes the dead were buried under the kiva, acknowledging their place into the underworld and its relationship to the middle world. So I end this presentation somewhere in the underworld, which if time permitted, is a good place to start talking about Chaco astronomy. After all, when the sun disappears beneath the horizon, we start to see the moon, the stars, and the planets. So perhaps next time. I thank you for listening to my sense of place at Chaco. I believe Steve's next, and I look forward to his presentation. Thank you. You know, thank you, Phil. I, I cannot compete with Ruth's landscape. I certainly can't compete with Phil's storytelling. I'm going to take ref the last refuge of the scoundrel and do a PowerPoint. I think I'm going to do a PowerPoint. There we go. Um, so Chaco is a, a place for us. I'm not, you know, I'm, talking as a white European in here, um, because of the great houses. It's a national park, it's a world heritage site. It wouldn't be those things without the great houses. Now, as Ruth has pointed out, and you know, was I think threaded through Phil's story there, it's a landscape. I mean, the whole, the whole canyon is, is a composed uh, built environment. 
but the individual great houses are what what uh, got it on the map, so to speak, uh, on, as a national park and a world heritage site. The great houses are, are monumental architecture, and they are architecture with a capital A. I mean, they were, they were designed by somebody or some small group and built by other people and probably occupied by yet a third group um, and dealt with over the years. They're laid out and planned, and you know, Phil can speak to that. Uh, they're, they're very, you know, Compared to what else is going on at that time, they're massive. They're you know very vertical. They go way up when uh, most other buildings at that time were a short story tall. Very permanent. They're still there today. You got to walk into them, and they're very expensive compared to what else was being built in the Southwest back then. They're very impressive uh, for us, and maybe oppressive, um, particularly in the last year. In the plague year, I've been getting lots of conversation and having lots of conversations with with Native American people and Navajos and, and Pueblo people where the memories of Chaco are not happy memories, not a happy place. Um, some bad things happened out there and in, including <laughs> governments, you know, elites, people with power. Um, for the great houses themselves, is, I think basically two orientations and, and Phil's done a lot of work on this. Uh, you have a cardinal, which is pretty easy to see, north, south, east, west. And oddly enough, there's only two of those. And then all the rest of them are some interesting spray of lunar or solstice. And we're, we're talking about the alignments of the back walls here that uh, might be aligning with the 18 year lunar cycle or with the yearly solstices. But what that does is it makes them open. Uh, the, the way the building opens is to the south, southeast or the southeast. And that's I think the traditional way of laying out a building long before Chaco, uh, you know, vaguely north south, but mostly southeast and south southeast is the way that a house would would face. Um, between lunar and, and solstice, uh, you know, so, uh, there's only a half dozen degrees, which I don't want to force preternatural precision on these guys. Um, excuse me, just a second here that they're doing this with naked eye and a piece of string and a rock. So, you know, we want to be off by a few degrees. Uh, we got to let them, let them be off by a few degrees and not gig them. Um, the cardinal buildings are of particular interest to me because uh, there's only two of them that, that start off cardinal. Uh, there's one I'll talk about in a minute that ends up cardinal. It started off uh, the solstice line or whatever that is, the southeast line. But Pueblo Alto and Kletzen, which just happened to be at the north end and the south end, uh, north south There was an interesting Hey everyone, we're having just a little technical difficulty with Steve's connection. Hang in there. We will try to get everything working shortly. Steve, it looks like we have you back. And if you want to get your screen back up, I'm not exactly sure where we lost you exactly. But okay. Maybe a minute or two before where you think you are. But you you can uh, you can hear me now. We can hear you and we can see you. I think we've got you back. Okay. Not sure what happened there, but um, the internet guys out. Uh, I was talking about Pueblo Alto and Sinkletson are the two cardinal buildings. The buildings are, are laid out cardinal uh, originally um, to north, south, east, west. And Pueblo Alto is at the north end and Sinkletson is at the south end of this line that John Fritz noticed in the, in the 70s, which constitutes the central planning line for Chaco. The, the great houses and other features are arranged symmetrically on either side of that. And Pueblo Alto was built in the 1020s initially. Sinkletson in the 1100s. Uh, this is not the first time that 
non-contemporary um, structures uh, were part of a larger construct, a larger built environment. But I got to dig, dig. I got to excavate the the uh, central room block at Pueblo Alto, and underneath the great big building, um, there was an earlier great house. It's much smaller rooms. You see the rooms 50 and 51. I'm not sure if you can see my my uh, cursor there. Um, that had been raised right to their foundations, but the foundations were the same as the foundations for the later Pueblo Alto. I mean, they're big, massive, chocolate foundations, and that was, you know, probably a massively built house. It was just small, but it's right smack dab in the middle of that building, and it was built in the 900s. So I think that north-south line uh, was there from at least the 900s and probably even earlier. And if we went under Sinclatsen at this point, which not going to happen, but I would not be at all surprised if there was an earlier structure under Sinclatsen. Uh, you know, these important places had buildings added on and on and on and on on top of them. Um, so that north-south line, I think, has some antiquity at Chaco, and it was very, very important to, uh, <laughs> how to say this, you know, it had some cosmological importance. I mean, everybody in the world could see north. North was universally known. All you had to do was watch the stars revolve around that central point in, in the sky, and that was north. It had no economic value. It didn't help you, you know, know when to plant or when to dance or anything like that. It just was there. And Chaco, I think, kind of uh, appropriated North and made North its reason to be. So there's, there's kind of a con, possibly a conflict between the old order of the lunar solstice stuff and this new cardinal thing that, again, everybody knew about North, but only Chaco really did anything with it. And then they did it you know, in your face, um, you know, the ways that you couldn't uh, ignore. And this plays out at Pueblo Benito, which probably was the earliest of the great houses, you know, in the 850, something like that. I mean, since, since uh, Pinasco Blanco is one of the other ones and Una Vida is the, the third, uh, only limited excavations in Una Vida and none essentially at Pinasco Blanco. They could be as old, um, but this is sort of seems to be like the heart of the canyon, as it were, where it's all where it starts. Um, Benito starts off as an arc, uh, and this is in the eight, 850s, 900s, something like that. About the same time they built that little great house up on, that's now under Pueblo Alto, um, pointing to the south southeast. I mean, there's not much question about that. It's not it's not pointing north south at all. It's pointing south southeast, which is again sort of the default for the way they built these buildings. That was the old way, and you, if you go to Pueblo Benito, and, yeah, you can actually see some of these arguments being played out in architecture on the ground, where they, you know, they wanted to straighten this thing out at one time, and they thought about it, they built a series of foundations off to the east, and they didn't like the alignment, and so they built another series of foundations, another series of foundations, and, and you know, very extensive. It was gonna straighten this whole thing out, and eventually cooler heads prevailed, and somebody said, oh, the hell with that, and let's just keep the curve. And, and they came back and, and uh, uh, maintained the curve uh, of the older building in their construction right up to the 1100s. But right up in the 1100s, right towards the end, um, some pothead, wild-eyed radical, as I was describing them to, uh, to Phil, um, decided, no, we're going to take this thing cardinal, right? And they did that very simply by building a wall right down the middle of the plaza that separated two halves of the building. And then, of course, the wall to the lower left is east-west. This is really north-south. With some precision, uh, later in question and answers, if you want, we can talk about you know how precision and why it's okay to be off six degrees for solstice, but not six degrees for north, because you can get very precise in north. It's not hard to do, and uh, it was clearly something where they wanted it to be north south. It wasn't just a wall dividing the plaza into east half and west half, and you can see that. There's the wall. Um, you can see that where the wall runs over, there's those two great kivas, and they're both in use at the time. They're both apparently roofed and in use when they're building this wall. Uh, they had to thread the needle between the two. The, the, the wall was tangent to the larger great kiva in the lower right, and it had to, to, to actually be north. They couldn't divert it a degree or two and miss the other great kiva to the upper left. They ran it right across uh, the open great kiva. You know, by open, I mean it was roof, but it was, you know, it was a functioning building. They ran that wall right across an arc, a cord, excuse me, a cord of that uh, um, structure on three or four huge logs that were still in place when Neil Judd excavated this. The wall, of course, had toppled. I mean, you see it on either end. You know, you see it 
north of the Kiva and south of the Kiva. And then these beams running along where, where they would have supported the wall, which is, this is pretty tricky stuff. Um, and, you know, for engineering, this is uh, brave, brave stuff. So yeah, they were making a real statement right at the end there that north-south is going to be more important than southeast. Um, and of course, the north-south, for those of you that know my writing or my thinking on this, that the north-south line actually structures their world, uh, the political world anyway, where after Chaco, and Kathy will talk about this, they moved north to Aztec. And after Aztec, maybe after Aztec, maybe not. Uh, they Some of them moved south to Pakimé. I say that because Aztec is, the architectural mass of Aztec is only about half of that at Chaco if you put all the buildings together for enclosed space. And Pakimé is about the same. It's about half the size of, of Chaco in terms of architectural mass. Um, and it's interesting to note that for Aztec, they, they go straight north, build Aztec, and it's solstice. So no question about it. It's a solstice orientation that faces southeast. You know, they're thumbing their noses at those, those uh, cardinal people. But if you go south to Pakime, Casas Grandes, it's a cardinal city. That's how the, the excavator described it as cardinal city. It's like it's designed on Etch-a-Sketch, you know, north, east, north, west, north, yeah, south, east. It's, it's absolutely cardinal uh, as much as they can. And I'm not sure how much time I've got left here. Um, I'll give myself penalty minutes for when I was off the air. Um, you know, why was Chaco at Chaco? I think Ruth hit the nail on the head there is because what happened in Basket Maker? Basket Maker 3, the M3 down there, uh, the biggest by far and most interesting, you know, huge Basket Maker site is Chaco. And if we say Chaco, it's the canyon. If there's two big known Basket Maker sites at either end of the canyon, and then all down the middle of the canyon, there's basket maker sites everywhere. And there's no, you know, regular basket maker site is one, one pit house or two pit houses. Find a basket maker site with five pit houses, you write a book and retire. Well, okay, that lasts from 500 to 700. And then it jumps up north where the Pueblo won the following period is 700 to 900. By far the biggest and most complicated um, Pueblo one site with all the weirdest architecture of that period is just south of Durango, which is just north of Chaco. I mean, this thing is, exactly due north of Hungo Poppy. And after P1, this is an area where there was nobody, then there's this huge Pueblo One site, and then there's nobody after that. They disappear. Well, I don't think they disappear. They go back down to Chaco, which is the biggest Pueblo Two site anywhere. Um, we don't need to go on, on Chaco much, but then finally they move it north to Aztec ruins. And I think that's where Kathy is gonna pick it up. Um, hopefully you can hear me through that. And I don't know if Kathy can hear me or not, but. Um, thanks, Steve. And if you can unshare your screen, I'll share mine. I think I'm out. Okay. All right. Oops. Mine bumped into a, <laughs> to a rolling along there. All right, so um, as all of our speakers so far have said, Chaco was a remarkable place. It was known throughout the Southwest for almost 300 years. Um, then suddenly it wasn't. It, the last cutting date for a roof beam in Chaco Canyon in a Chaco Canyon Great House is about AD 1130. And archeologists generally mark that as the end of Chaco's reign. Um, so 1130, some go as late as 1150. So, so the question is what happened? Why did this once vibrant place go silent? Um, well, as Steve just said, we, we know that the ideas that animated Chaco didn't end. They moved north. Uh, the Ch as Chaco Canyon faded, Aztec ruins, which is about 60 miles north of, um, of Chaco, um, or six, about 60 kilometers north of Chaco, took over as the center of the Great House world. Aztec was another sprawling complex. Um, and you can see on the overview map at the upper left um, that um, there are at least four Great Houses here with an enormous community. Those little, little squares that you see there um, are community site, community small, small sites. Um, the image in the upper right focuses on the, um, on the three of the Great Houses that are below the terrace. 
Um, and Ruth and her students excavated the, the one on the Terrace Aztec North a few years ago. Um, the image on the bottom right is Aztec West, or the West Ruin at Aztec. Uh, and, and that's the only one of the great houses that's been extensively excavated. Aztec was the center of a new regional system in the late 1100s and 1200s, but that region was much smaller than the region that centered on Chaco. For more than um, for more than a century, archaeologists have wondered why people left Chaco Canyon, um, and perhaps the most common explanation is um, is drought uh, drought that occurred sometime between 1130 and 1180. Um, today, Chaco is an extremely arid area. Any of you that have, have visited out there, you know it's very, very dry. Uh, so drought might seem like a reasonable explanation, uh, given that Chaco people were agriculturalists. And of course, Phil brought up the importance of water in his, um, his part. Um, they depended on water, uh, rainwater to, to, um, to help grow their crops. Um, but the timing of this explanation is off. Um, major construction had already started on Aztec uh, ruins by 1100, um, but 1100 was long before the drought started. So it's hard to link a drought in the sort of mid 1100s with the um, with people leaving uh, Chaco. Now the West Ruin. This is a this is a huge building. The West Ruin at Aztec was built in perhaps only a little more than a decade. The leaders who were organizing this effort obviously had control of a significant labor force because they put this big, big building together very quickly. Um, the huge building effort at Aztec was also going on just about the same time that massive construction, some of the bigger construction episodes at Chaco were going on. Um, so you have to wonder if there's a competition between Chaco and leaders. Perhaps some wanted to move uh, north and others didn't. Uh, in the end, the move to the north happened, uh, but it's interesting to think about how the, how the arguments were going then. Now there's some evidence that um, Chaco and leaders had been thinking about moving north long before they actually did. Solomon Ruins. Uh, Solomon Ruins was built on the San Juan River about AD 1090. Uh, Solomon's a very large great house. It's as large as some of the individual building episodes at Chaco Canyon. Chaco and leaders may have even marked this spot uh, where Solomon was going to be built. About 20 years before um, the, the bulk of Solomon was built, uh, there was a four room unit constructed here right on the same spot. So this seems like good evidence that moving north was on the minds of Chaco and leaders long before it actually happened. So in the end, Solomon ruins didn't become a new Chaco and capital. Instead, it was Aztec. Um, so one explanation why for why uh, it was Aztec and not Solomon, is the location of, of Solomon right on the San Juan River. The San Juan is big, it's prone to flooding, um, and this may have made Solomon a more precarious and less appealing place to live. In contrast, um, Aztec is located on the um, smaller and more manageable uh, Animus River. And in fact, the, there's evidence that uh, people at Aztec used the Animus River uh, for irrigation, they built little canals off of it. So that was doable on the on the Animus, uh, not so on the on the uh, San Juan. Um, so Chaco's leaders, or at least some of them, may have thought that Aztec was an easier place to make a living than Chaco Canyon was. But there are, it are, were almost certainly other political and ideological factors that figured into this decision, and this sort of picks up. Uh, what uh, with what Steve was talking about about the um, the movement north and south, and he takes it all the way down into Mexico. Um, so there's quite a bit of evidence that uh, the idea of Chaco and great houses came from the north. Uh, Richard Wilshusen and Scott Ortman have proposed that one of the structures at the McPhee Village site in southwestern Colorado was a prototype for the McPhee for the the Chaco and great houses. Um, in other words, the place where Chaco and ideas of social organization and community began. Um, th so this image uh, shows the largest room block at McPhee Village tucked inside an outline of Pueblo Benito. And uh, this comes from an article that Richard Wilshusen and Ruth Van Dyke wrote. Um, 
the dashed line is the outline of Pueblo Benito and McPhee Village fits inside that. Um, but you can see it has a, the same sort of semicircular form as Benito. It has an oversized pit, pit structure in the area that's, um, you know, a plaza-like area. And again, this is like Pueblo Benito. Now, in the end, um, there was a movement to the south. Uh, Richard Wolshusen and Ruth um, have made convincing, a convincing case that at the end of the, of the P1 period, there was a significant movement of people from southwestern Colorado um, down into northwestern New Mexico in the area around Chaco Canyon. So is it possible that areas to the north of Chaco were remembered by future generations as an original homeland? Um, could this memory have been a factor in the construction of Salmon and then Aztec? And I think, um, I think Steve's points um, sort of tie in with this, this idea. Um, it, it might be difficult to prove the tie between North and South, the Chaco and, and the um, Southwest Colorado archeologically, but one line of evidence is the Great North Road uh, and that connects Chaco Canyon, Salmon and Aztec. John Stein and his colleagues have demonstrated uh, years ago that Chaco and roads function to inscribe memories on the ground. The fact that seemingly um, enormous effort was made to construct a wide straight road connecting these three places is significant evidence that Chaco and people felt ideologically connected, not only to Chaco Canyon, but also to a Northern homeland. So, so connected that they wrote this idea on the ground in, in, um, in the form of this great North Road. Now, even though uh, archeologists sometimes imply that everybody left Chaco Canyon by AD 1130 or 1150, this isn't quite true. Um, there is ceramic evidence that a few people were still living there right through the, the 1200s. They weren't building great houses, although I, I will mention one exception to this point. Um, and there weren't very many people there in Chaco, but the canyon wasn't completely empty. Mesa Verde black on white pottery was found in a free, few rooms at Pueblo Manito, and this suggests that people were using these rooms in the late 1200s. But the use seems to have been fairly ephemeral. There were also some small sites that were built and occupied during the late 1100s and 1200s. Again, the population was small. Now, one possible exception to the statement that Great House construction had ceased is um, the tri-wall structure at Pueblo del Arroyo. Um, this is a, you know, a circular structure you can see. You can see at the top there is a, um, a drawing by Dennis Holloway. And then on the bottom, you can see the, the actual structure itself. These are, these are, are common structures in the um, late 1100s and 1200s in the Mesa Verde region. Um, there was some evidence that it was built in the early 1100s, but other archaeologists think that it was built actually after AD 1150. Um, so there's kind of a difference of, of opinion among archaeologists. So um, it's difficult to tell when this, this structure was actually built, but it is somewhat reminiscent of, of Mesa Verde architecture because it was so common uh, in the late 1100s and 1200s to the north. Salmon and Aztec were, of course, not the only great houses built in the Mesa Verde region. Uh, this map shows the distribution of Chaco and great houses, both those built during the Chaco era, when Chaco was the center of this, of this region, and those built in the, the post-Chaco era. So archaeologists do disagree about what to call a great house. I mean, they, you know, what are the characteristics that lead us to call something a great house? Um, but, you know, that aside, there may have been as many as 40 great houses in the, in the northern San Juan region, in this Mesa Verde region. Um, so far to the north of Chaco Canyon. Um, most were built after 10 AD 1075, and many of them had uh, occupations that continued well past the end of the Chaco era as a, uh, well to past the end of Chaco Canyon as a, as a regional center. So Chaco ended 1130, 1150, um, these buildings were still in use. Now, interestingly, the post Chaco, the late occupations of these great houses had a common pattern. Um, oftentimes you find at post Chaco and great houses that the big Chaco era rooms, so Chaco era, Chaco era rooms were really big. Um, but during the post Chaco era, 
um, they divide them. Um, they divide them in half into much cozier domestic structures that were easy to heat and comfortable to live in. Um, you can see um, in this, this is a diagram of Solomon Pueblo, and you can see a number of these Chaco era rooms that were divided. Um, you can see the dividing walls. I pointed them out with the, with the red arrows. So, so basically a, a wall was just um, built right in the center of a room and divided it into two rooms. Um, round rooms uh, called kivas by many archeologists were, were placed into existing rooms. This is another common post Chaco pattern. Um, and you can see many of them here um, indicated by the by the uh, blue arrows, and this is, you know, I'm pointing it out at Solomon, but it's it's common for many post Chaco um, sites in the northern San Juan. Um, when you look at the ground plan of these great big houses, uh, great houses like Solomon or Aztec or or others, uh, recognize that the round rooms you see were mostly not part of the original construction. Um, they were added later. They were added during the post Chaco era, and so this is something I'm I think. Uh, Chaco scholars ought to keep in mind when they're when they're re when they're examining these buildings. Um, so I want to conclude this this section about the end of Chaco with some thoughts about the concepts of Chaco and Mesa Verde. Since early in the study of Chaco Canyon, some archaeologists have argued for an intrusion of Mesa Verde people into Chaco Canyon in the early 1100s, essentially displacing um, the the original Chaco and residents. This assertion was based primarily on architectural style and to some extent on ceramics. Um, more recently, a number of archaeologists have argued that there was no Mesa Verde intrusion. Now, one important line of evidence against the idea of a Mesa Verde intrusion is the fact that there are actually all kinds of masonry site styles in, uh, in Chaco Canyon great houses through time. So they have a variety of styles. There isn't a single Chaco and masonry style that was replaced by a unique Mesa Verde masonry style. In fact, what people call Mesa Verde style architecture um, was common in Chaco Canyon even before 1100. Uh, similarly, uh, the ceramic styles in the two regions are quite similar. Um, so do we really need that dividing line? Um, following uh, some arguments that Steve's made a number of, of years ago, I believe that Chaco Mesa Verde sort of ethnic or cultural division is, is spurious. These regions might well not have been recognized by the people who lived here from AD 800 to 1300. Instead, these patterns are temporal. Uh, they, they indicate different periods, different time periods of use. Politically now, the center of this large uh, area did change. The first center was in Chaco, and then the political center later moved to Aztec. Um, but if you look carefully through time, you can see people moving back and forth between these two areas. These, these aren't different ethnic groups um, periodically intruding on one another's territory, um, but the same people are using different parts of the larger region at different times. So, um, so that's just a, a little idea about the, about the things that we call Chaco and, and Mesa Verde and how they might have played out on the ground. Um, so. That's the end of my part. And now we'll turn it over to Michael. Uh, he's going to um, invite you to present questions and the four of us will try and answer them the best we can. We may ask, uh, the panelists may ask each other questions. And um, so we'll go on from there. Thanks for those great presentations, all four of you. Um, a couple of questions have come in and I can throw in some of my own uh, pending additional ones arriving. Um, First is by Linda, she says, once a long time ago on a tour, we were told that one problem with Chaco is that they cut down all the trees. Is there any truth to that theory? And let me add a, a sort of a related question. Can you say something about what the environment was like in the 10th century? Was it radically different from today? Was it drier, wetter? Um, it seems to be a sort of relevant issue. I, I think this is a good one for either Steve or Ruth. Say Ruth, she's out there. <laughs> she's out there. <laughs> yeah. You want to handle that one, Ruth? You go ahead. I, I was actually busily typing a different question of my own, so I think oh, it's okay. all yours. Um, 
Uh, cutting down all the trees, no. Uh, you know, there may have been pine forests out of Chaco, but it was many, 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 many years before they were building those buildings. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the wood from those buildings is coming from the Chusca Mountains and from the Zuni Mountains and San Juan Mountains. There's even wood that's coming from Mesa Verde down to build those th uh, things. Um, my take on the environment was that it wasn't terribly different than what you see today. I mean, what you see today has been overgrazed and, you know, there's all kinds of intrusive plants and all that sort of stuff. And of course, you know, it, it, the whole Southwest waffles between wet and dry and wet and dry. But I don't think it was ever a, personally, I don't think it was ever a Garden of Eden. You know, there are some archaeologists that are trying to say that, oh yeah, they're you know, growing corn out there like it was Iowa. And I just, I just based on the history of Navajo people out there, they, they couldn't do that. And they were good farmers. Um, I don't think it was too much different uh, from what you see today, at least in terms of climate. It's a little hotter now then, thanks to us, uh, now than, than then. Uh, but of course, the vegetation's changed quite a bit because of grazing and introduced species. So Steve, when you talk about this, you know, the tremendous effort to bring these logs in from distant you know, from the Chuskas and other places. And when I think about the staggering labor that had to be marshaled, mobilized and led um, at Chaco and these various sites, it's hard to imagine that, at least if you look comparatively in anthropology and archeology, span it's hard to imagine that without some kind of social hierarchy. Uh, and yet I've never seen, maybe I just don't know the literature as well, but I haven't seen a lot of literature on hierarchy. Do we know anything about that? Was there a permanent leadership class? Am I, am I taking you into dangerous territory? <laughs> I wrote a book about it. Yeah, I think there's nobles, but not everybody does. <laughs> Ruth, you want to? I'm just laughing because, yeah, Steve is probably the person best known for arguing that yes there absolutely were hierarchical elites at Chaco and like you said he did write a book but yeah I mean I've often followed that same line of thinking there's there's no way that all of this happens without some serious leadership and some of our colleagues recently have done work um, demonstrating that there was a matrilineage you know there's a lot of very elite burial goods in Pueblo Benito I mean I think it's pretty clear there's also um, work done by some of you guys, Chaco, old Chaco Project colleagues um, on, the, on the nutrition, the differential nutrition of people in great houses versus small sites. I think it's pretty clear that there were some people here who were a lot better off and probably had a lot more sway than others. We also, of course, have um, stories from, from Pueblo and from Navajo oral traditions about this kind of thing. And Steve, you were mentioning that earlier. I mean, do you want to elaborate about the kind of dark things that maybe went on according to, to oral traditions? Um, yeah, just in the last year, I've been getting emails, you know, in the pandemic year, emails from both Navajo people and Pueblo people who maybe caught me on a webinar or something. I mean, you know, <laughs> they're, they're saying, yeah, you know, and, and this is a by a sample. These are the people that are contacting me, right? You know, the rest, rest of the folks out there may be going, Lexus crazy. They're saying, yeah, you know, there were people out there that were, you're calling nobles, but you had a different name for them, but, you know, they had power over people. And that's not how we run our lives these days. That, you know, they experimented with having that kind of a social structure and it ended badly. I mean, some of these people are saying, you know, really, Chaco was not a nice place at all. That really bad things happened out there. Um, I can believe it. Uh, but they don't do that now. And, and a lot of what they do today, uh, in fact, there was an article that I just read by Lee Kuhn Wisma talking about Hopis, um, and I don't know, Phil, if you've seen this one or not, but that Wapaki was where the Hopis uh, leadership gets together and rejects the old philosophies and comes up with the Hopi way of life. And of course, Wapaki is right after Chaco, chronologically, you know, the archaeology kind of works that, yeah, the, a lot of Pueblos, I think, reinvented themselves to be anti-Chaco, is to be not like that. Uh, well, continuing a lot of this, you know, a lot of the, the things it's not not that it's not part of their history and tradition of course it is but i think a lot of stuff got sloughed off and i don't know Phil, if that jives with anything you you know or anything you think philip you're going to jump in on this one oh. <laughs> um i'm i'm sorry um i I don't know. <laughs> I simply don't know. I do. I, I know that the um, uh, 
there's no question about the, the connection to uh, Hopi uh, to uh, way to the south. Uh, I mentioned uh, when uh, LeBlanc, uh, Steve LeBlanc with his help did a DNA study, uh, my uh, DNA then other than the people at Chaco, uh, the next group that was had promise was from Chile. And so how did Hopis get uh, uh, DNA from some of the tribes that are in, Ch in Chile today. Well, it's pretty clear someone uh, someone crossed answer specifically the question uh, of that. It's it's just simply buried too far back in the sands of time to know exactly if the change in 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 Hopi occurred with the introduction of, uh, of the mass dances in the casinas and and then in the concept of the of the of the uh, flower world and uh, I do believe these came from the south and it it could have easily come from uh, uh, um, something from Pakame but I have I don't I can't speak to it so Ruth has got a question. I don't know if Kathy got it, uh, but she asks, Kathy, uh, do you want to talk about your work on violence against women? Is that relevant to Chaco? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I'll just talk a little bit about, the, as Michael mentioned when uh, he did the, my introduction, I've, I've worked on um, the study of captives in prehistory. And I, this has been a global study. It's not just Southwest and certainly not Chaco. Um, but I found that pretty much universally um, societies at this level of social organization um, engage in warfare and take captives. And the captives are most often women and children. Um, so some of them are incorporated as wives or as you know secondary wives. Some are kept as slaves. Um, it, it really depends around the world at, at, you know how they're treated in the society they join changes or is different. Um, and I did take this idea to Chaco once um, and to wonder whether there were women, you know, who were there unwillingly who were trying to build great houses or who were very involved in building the great houses. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you have slaves, you make them work and you do things like have them, you know, build things. Um, the identification of people who are captives or enslaved in a, in a society is really based on, on human remains. Some bioarchaeologists have actually looked at human remains in Chaco and around Chaco and found um, occasionally women who seem to have suffered violence, which is what you'd expect with somebody who wasn't fully incorporated into the society. So that's you know, the evidence is very circumstantial for Chaco. Um, cannot say for sure if there were people like that, if there are women like that, but certainly based on ethno-historical evidence, global ethno-historic evidence, and this bioarchaeological evidence, there could have been. Um, so maybe I'll just leave it at that. But thanks. Um, there are a lot of questions pouring in. I'm not sure we're gonna to get to all of them, but one, it's kind of an interesting one, the question from an anonymous, Participant is: Are there any square kivas at Chaco? What's the significance of square versus round? Ruth has has written books on on kivas, so uh, certainly. No, this, is, this isn't Steve. This is because Steve doesn't even like the kivas. Steve's written the whole thing about the round room. So, so Steve, what are those things? <laughs> Tell us why you don't oh. think they're kivas, or why we shouldn't call them kivas. All of that. Let me let me do the square first. Um, that's certainly a style contemporary with Chaco over in the Hopi country, over in, in um, what the archaeologists call Cayenta. Um, they had square kivas that had all the attributes of the round kivas of Chaco. I'm thinking, you know, there are, there are square rooms like Kathy was saying that they they shoved later, you know, like uh, after the wheels had fallen off. They shoved kivas into square rooms, and there's a couple. I think it's Salmon where they you can still see the square walls, but it, it's not because they intended them to be square. You know, they're they're uh, just rounding off the corners. So yeah, there's a significance to square kivas. I don't think they're a big part of the repertoire 
uh, for the four corner for the Mesa Verde and Chaco areas that they are over in Phil's part of the world over in northeastern Arizona. Hmm. Just real briefly, what Ruth was alluding to is that I don't think those little round rooms, all the little round rooms that we point at, say they're kivas, are anything like a modern kiva. You know, it's like the ones you see in the Rio Grande. I mean, for example, uh, in Rio Grande, you have one one of those things for a village or two of those things for a village, and they're very specifically for particular kinds of ceremonial and community things. But it's one or two per village. Um, for the house be, houses before Chaco and during Chaco and after Chaco for normal people consist of four, four or five rooms and one of these little round rooms. It's a family. And it's a pretty dysfunctional family if it needs, you know, it needs, well, not dysfunctional, but you know, I don't think everybody has their own church. Uh, I think it's, it's their pit houses, which is what these guys lived in for centuries. Hmm. Uh, they just get, just as the rooms behind them get more elaborate and fancier, so do the round rooms get more elaborate and fancier. They get masonry walls and all that kind of stuff. Hmm. So I think they're pit houses. Having said that, it doesn't negate what Phil said earlier about the symbolism, because around the world, you know, the people that do vernacular architecture and Amos Rapp people like Amos Rappaport, people's houses, in addition to their larger structures, their public structures, that their houses embody cosmologies that that you know they're they're it's exactly as, as Phil said. It's just I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. They, I think people are mainly living in them, and there's certainly there's a lot of ceremony. There's household level ceremony, but they're not the village level ceremony or the clan level ceremony or the society level ceremony that you get in, in as I understand it, what goes on in modern Cubans. Well, so there's an interesting question from Olivia that touches on that. She says several speakers have focused on great house sites, but do you consider small houses quote unquote crafted spaces as well? Um, how do you think that these spaces and their roles in keeping the pub ancestral pueblos connected to their ancestors functioned? But well, you've just said, Steve, that you feel that the houses embody the cosmology just as much as these round structures. Is that true? I mean, did I? Well, yeah, I was uh, keying off of what Phil said earlier that the, the architecture of, call it a kiva, call it a pit house, whatever, that that also embodies the cosmology. That he made that point very eloquently, and I'm not arguing that, that the round rooms don't do that, but I think they're mainly domestic and not, you know, purely ceremonial structures. The, the small sites. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Well, I I could add to that that um, Bill Lipes has this idea. Bill Lipes, an archaeologist, um, Southwest archaeologist, uh, has has this idea that small sites um, follow something that he calls the San Juan pattern, and they are sort of um, semicircular or yeah, curved. They have a, a pit structure or several pit structures in front of them and then a trash mound. It's a very, very strong pattern. And Steve's in his writing has made the point that if you look at uh, something like Pueblo Benito, it's just a very expanded version of that same pattern. So I don't know, Steve, if you wanna uh, move on from that. The early parts of Pueblo Benito and then it takes off they start adding all kinds of warehouses and other stuff. But the small, I mean, I don't want to dominate the conversation, but the small sites are houses. I mean, you know, people are living in those things. And people that are probably socially different than the people who are living in the great houses. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question from Patricia about Pakime. She says, do you know if the people who lived in Pakime were related to the people in Chaco Canyon or culturally, biologically, what's, what's known about the connection? Should I, I guess I'll take that one because I brought it up. Uh, I, I think the upper crusts were certainly inspired by Chaco, but most of the people down there probably are coming from members. And it, there's a lot of DNA and bioarchaeological work that kind of confirms that, along with lots of local people that were already in the valley and then, you know, people from West Mexico and all over. I mean, Pakime was a real like Tetu Akan just sucked in people from all different directions, but I, I don't think you had a whole lot of folks from the Four Corners down there. You, had, you might have, I think you had some and they were important people. Um, I'm gonna sort of blend a couple of questions here, but um, Irene asks, what about future excavations or are there other areas that can be excavated? Um, there must be lots of questions uh, about that. Is, is that Ruth's uh, territory or is that? Is it extreme? I, my understanding is it's extremely difficult to get permission to excavate uh, 
near Chaco? Yeah, I mean, Kathy and, and Steve, you know, you've successfully excavated an outlier, what, about 10 years ago um, that you all were able to, because it was owned by Bluff, by the city, I think. Yeah. People. Anyway, um, the, the Chaco, Chaco proper, it's a, it's a national monument, right? And the National Park Service mandate is to, um, to protect and to, uh, the word is, the actual, the, the English word is escaping me right now that I need, but basically to preserve and protect and take care of um, the archaeology. And so excavation permits just from that perspective would have to be justified um, by, by the researcher as, you know, something that we really need to do because this is the only way we can answer question X. But um, beyond that, certainly since the passage of NAGPRA in 1990, archaeologists in the Southwest have started to do a better job, as you see here today, of talking with our, our, our Native colleagues and the descendants of the people who created these places. These are ancestral to, you know, nat the Native peoples of the Southwest today. And a lot of them would prefer that we not disturb their ancestors' homes. And so out of, out of deference and respect, because these are not you know, I'm very interested in Chaco, like we all are here, and I've spent a lot of my career, um, you know, thinking about it, but they're not my ancestors. <laughs> they're, they're Philip's ancestors, and there are other Native colleagues. Uh, we're having some problems with your audio, Ruth. It's kind of gone uh, wonky. The internet is not our friend today, I guess. Um, okay, well, somebody else can pick that up because. Anybody want to take the baton on that one? I think Ruth did a great job, so. Okay. Um, uh, probably just one more question, then we should wind down. Um, so here's a, this is an anonymous uh, attendee who says A decade ago, I visited Chaco, and there was a theory that it may have been a huge ceremonial center not for daily living, no middens and so on. You seem to be saying that that's definitely not a true hypothesis that people did live in the kivas and villages, is that correct? Uh, Steve, I don't know if you wanna, okay, well, uh, or Ruth, do you wanna roll on with that? I can, but it's your show, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just say really quickly that there are huge trash mounds there uh, some people see lots of ceremonial trash in them. Um, Steve and I both worked in Chaco Canyon many years ago and excavated, that project excavated a big trash midden at, um, at Pueblo Alto. Um, Chip Wills recently excavated uh, the one at Pueblo Benito. So there's, there's lots of trash there. Uh, there's, there's quite a bit of evidence of people living there, but the great houses were not like a Pueblo where many people live. Um, the idea is that the people who live there were special people and there weren't a ton of them. There weren't very many of them. So I don't know, Ruth, do you want to pick up from there? Um, yeah, I mean, I just, you, you explained that very well, Kathy, but um, we shouldn't forget that there are literally hundreds of small domestic pueblos in the canyon. So there were lots yeah. of people living in the canyon and the focus always seems to be on those great houses. And I agree with you. I, I think people did leave it, live in them, but I think they were elites, right? Um, so a lot of those rooms were not actually living rooms and we can't count the number of people by the count of number of rooms, but that doesn't mean Chaco was empty. Uh, but, but as the, the, the person was asking, this is not like an either or. People were living here, but people were also coming here to gather, right? So it's not like if people were living here, that means this was not a pilgrimage center um, by the same token. If people came here as to uh, periodically to to gather to do rituals like as pilgrims if we want to use that word that doesn't mean nobody lived here so i think it's both and i think it's just important to tease the different kinds of evidence apart that support lots of different kinds of things happening here well thank you very much for coming up on the 75 minute marks it's a good uh time to and this part of the event, uh, those of you who are members or wish to become members can join us for a more informal conversation in about 45 minutes, uh, and you will receive a link for that Zoom event. I'm not sure everybody on the screen will be able to join us. I'm not sure about Ruth and Philip, um, but if you do, that would be wonderful. But thank you, you all. Of course, um, all of you are longtime 
allies of, of SAR, and we greatly appreciate your expertise and your willingness to join us for this conversation. And thanks to the 286 people who joined us for this, this event. So long, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.